All right, well, welcome to our second panel. Uh, I'm Link Bloomfield. I'm the chairman of the Stimson Center, and it's my honor to be able to welcome our, our partners here from, from Trends Advisory and from the Orfila Center at UCSB. Um, I'm pleased to be able to participate in this panel. And we, to, after the first group, which I thought was extremely interesting and set quite a, uh, an inspiring and thought-provoking tone, now we're going to hear from two credentialed Americans who uh, have done some deep dives on groups that we're here to talk about, extremist groups, violent groups, to see what sort of insights they have uh, divined from their research and to give you some sense of the kinds of advice um, that the U.S. government may be hearing from experts such as these. Um, I'm joined today by Professor Craig Whiteside of the Naval War College, who is going to speak first, and the bios are in the book, uh, and by Dr. Scott Anglin of the Orphala Center. Both of these gentlemen have um, have credentialed backgrounds in the national security space in the United States. So having heard some very strong academic and, and some international views on extremism and the history of extremism and ways to think of extremism and ways not to think of extremism, let's hear now from two experts and we're going to start with Professor Whiteside. So from a 30,000 uh, foot view, of terrorism studies, and I don't, I'm not a terrorist expert. I don't claim to be a terrorist expert. I look at irregular warfare. So um, as the or original panel talked about, a multidisciplinary approach. I'd like to start, first I'd like to apologize if, uh, if this is too granular uh, ahead of time, but uh, bear with me, please. I'm going to start by reading the, an, an introduction to my paper. The descent into disorder began years before the crisis with whispers of the return of veterans from the previous war and announcements from a political front representing a competing shadow government opposed to the incumbent. The murky deaths of political figures in the hinterlands are written off as banditry, local blood debts, and revenge killings, unremarkable in a society long riven by internecine conflict. Seemingly random in pattern, the deaths soon become part of the rhythm of everyday life in the country, as unexplainable as they are inconsequential. The rising criminality in these areas soon block government services in the area, a fact buried by the bureaucracy and invisible to the leaders of the state who believe what they see in the capital is the reality of the state. Villages have no officials, taxes go uncollected, schools have no teachers. By the time the state's police and military units lose the ability to operate in these same rural areas, the, the situation has matured to an ex existential crisis for the state. If you think that's a description of what happened in Iraq over the last six years, uh, you'd be you would be correct. However, this general uh, vignette is an amalgamation of several accounts of the Vietnamese People's Revolutionary Party. It's campaign to defeat the Xiem regime from 1959 to 1963. It could easily pass for a description of what happened in the Sunni provinces of Iraq from 2008 to 2013, long before the world discovered the Islamic State often incorrectly described as an ex-Bathist cabal that invaded Iraq from Syria and easily defeated an unmotivated and corrupt Shia army of occupation, the Islamic State is better understood as a revolutionary movement that has learned, practiced, adjusted, and honed a successful political military doctrine in their state building campaign. They have deep roots in the population. They're determined to win a competition of government with the Iraqi government in short, they are very real and here to stay. So the inspiration for this research comes from Bernard Fall, who studied Vietnam and uh, made a lot of the observations that I used in my opening vignette. Um, after the Cold War, the, the, the understanding that uh, marked a powerful Marxist ideology in, com in uh, combination with uh, revolutionary warfare methods in warfare uh, was so powerful that it would eventually conquer the world, as uh, a subtitle on a, a book called War of the Flea describes. However, with the, the demise of the Soviet Union and the, and the kind of the demise of, of the proponent of ideology, um, you saw this, this idea wane, and you saw a lot of different conflicts around the world that were driven by this ideology and the methodology combination 
um, settle down um, and, and you have the period, the end of history type of idea. All right. Um, instead, what I'm arguing here is that uh, the, the group, the Islamic State movement is what I call it, um, and, and the larger movement, the Salafi Jihadi movement, uh, as Mia mentioned earlier, um, has adopted this Maoist framework for war. And they've taken it from their doctrinal influence of Musab al-Suri, Abu Musab al-Suri, and his lessons learned in the Syrian campaign. Many people point to several of his other works, if you're familiar with his works, as being influential on this particular group. However, um, what I found in my research and many other researchers have pointed out is that the, the group's originations in Afghanistan in the 1990s, uh, the camps in Herat, uh, under Abu Musab al-Zarqawi were populated mostly by Syrian veterans of the original campaign in the 70s and 80s, the Muslim Brotherhood uprising, which was crushed by uh, Hafez. Um, so you see uh, a lot of influence of this particular document. It's called the Lessons Learned in the Syrian Campaign. Um, this Maoist kind of idea behind it's so bear with me, it might seem a little odd to be talking about Mao and Marxism when you're talking about uh, Salafi jihadism, but it's a perfect blend of political military doctrine, which is something that attracts someone like Abu Musab al-Suri in his writings, um, as well as the understanding that they're up against very large odds. So that's the irregular warfare perspective. I traced in my paper the development of this doctrine from the Syria the experience in Syria in the 70s and 80s to Afghanistan in the 90s where they trained on these lessons learned. Um, the Syrians within Zarqawi's camp were called the traumatized ones and that kind of inspired this learning process. So this group is a learning organization to be sure. Um, what I did throughout the paper was a structured comparison with the Vietnamese campaign, the Vietnamese communist campaigns from 59 to 64 and then compared it to the Islamic State's kind of resurgence since 2008. My hypothesis, and I wanted to test this empirically, is how was the awakening movement, which if you're familiar with the awakening movement, it's a Sunni tribal and Sunni resistance movement that kind of defeated, helped defeat uh, what was known as Al-Qaeda in Iraq and technically the Islamic State of Iraq in 2007 and 8. Um, that's my uh, hypothesis. How was the uh, Islamic State a revolutionary movement? Um, it's a revolutionary movement because it's first and foremost an insurgency. However, insurgencies are focused primarily on replacing the government itself. Um, in this case, they want to use irregular warfare with government change, but also to change the society, the politics, the religions, and the economic aspects of this overarching society. So it's a revolutionary in that sense as opposed to a simple insurgency. Or terror, so that's, this is the one time I will use the term terror during this brief. They're also revolutionary in the sense, as some of our earlier commentators mentioned, that they want to replace not just a government with the caliphate, but they also want to disrupt the world order itself. Their, their learning and their writings about the Cold War reflect at least an understanding on their part that the communists and the, and the Soviets lost because they did not challenge that particular world order. They instead tried to integrate into it and, and, and set up opposing camps. And their idea is to disrupt that particular world, or, world order. Uh, critiques of, of the Islamic State as a revolutionary movement. Uh, Metz would say modern insurgencies are really hybrid criminal organizations that are very violent uh, and use coercive measures uh, due to uh, patronage networks. Um, other people have called the Islamic State a focalist movement, meaning it's a very small, all right, uh, very small, less dependent on the support of the population and kind of conducts a coup. So that's probably a, a very popular understanding of the Islamic State, except it doesn't answer why they're still around. Um, I argue that the Islamic State has, in fact, engaged the population in the area and tried very hard to win them over. It's a story that's not very well told, uh, and they use it through a carrot and stick approach. Um, I argue that the Islamic State has changed their strategy since 2008 um, in order to engage the tribal system and to win them over, um, as opposed to before where they focused on their destruction. Uh, it's difficult to argue again that uh, Asian communists influenced this particular group, other than the fact that you can read Mao in, in Suri's writings and you can read 
uh, that influenced this Marxist uh, and influence in a lot of the leadership statements of Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, but also Abu Omar al-Baghdadi, who replaced him, and the current caliph um, right now. Um, but there are, there are other influences in this particular group. Ibn Khaldun and his concept of asabiya, the special group feeling, um, also described warfare for the Arabs as trickery, small numbers, and superior morale, which you can see reflected in the Islamic State. They've also has considerable experience from the Afghan campaign, the Afghan Arabs, um, Suri's writings as well, and the Afghan camp experience. There's a lot of captured documents that have come out of the Afghan, Afghanistan camps out of after 2003 that show what type of training this particular, the leadership core uh, of this group was doing in the 1990s, um, Zarqawi and his, his cohort. Um, I'd like to just quickly read a couple of Suri's admonishments in his lessons learned in the Syrian campaign. Number one was to maintain a covert organization and avoid temptation of going public even when seeing success. You saw the Islamic State do that in 2003, the Islamic State movement. Push a centralized strategy with decentralized execution. Do not prioritize military activities over public opinion. Safeguard all communications. Quality over quantity and personnel. Ideology over military experience works best. Jihadists will learn in the College of War. Adopt a clear pattern of publicizing operations, but don't publicize the killings of Muslim informants. That actually the Islamic State has strayed from significantly. <laughs> Stay true to the Muslim banner. Avoid the draw of secularism. They're talking about the Muslim Brotherhood. Avoid that and, and in, case, in, in some cases fight them. And finally, to avoid factionalism, emphasize the indoctrination of their new members. Again, my hypothesis is that the Islamic State was successful because they won a Sunni civil war within their own communities. And they had to do that using revolutionary warfare methods to defeat these Sunni rivals before they were able to establish control throughout large parts of Iraq and then eventually in Syria as well. And I, and I, and I say that in that direction, that it happened in Iraq first and then it moved into Syria counter to uh, a little bit of the idea. The idea here is to eliminate government sympathizers and that once that happens, the security forces become blind. And they overreact, as we talked about in the previous uh, panel, and they lose support of the population due to the coercive measures. The Vietnamese, the Vietnamese communists, the comparison I'll talk about very briefly. In 1955 at the Treaty of Paris, the communists controlled 60% of the, of the rural villages in the south according to their own estimate, as well as uh, some documentation. By 1958, the Ziem regime had decimated the movement. For example, in one village, all 20 of the People's Revolutionary Party members had been arrested or imprisoned, all 20 in one single village. And they called this campaign the extermination of the traitor campaign, which, oh, by the way, is exactly what the Islamic State called the, uh, move, the uh, campaign against the Sawa, or awakening movement, in 2008 through 13. Um, examples in 1959, by 1959, these types of actions were, were prevalent. The disemboweling of village chiefs, their wives, and the decapitation of children in front of the entire village to demonstrate that the government had no control and that the future control of that village would be done by the party. These, were, these killings were vetted by party officials. Once the government representatives were gone, they established liberation committees of military affairs, recruitment, security, finance, media, taxes were collected in order to establish legitimacy. We see the Islamic State do the exact same thing from 2008 to 2013, if not earlier in some special cases, which I'll talk about. The Viet Cong, uh, criticized by their Chinese communist mentors, said it was less about violence, it was more about creating an unfair competition of governance. You can't govern if you're an absentee government. By the uh, 2006, not to recap much of what happened prior, but the Islamic State movement is almost exclusively Iraqi, contrary to most perceptions, with a few foreign fighters who are at the top and are prominent. But to be honest, it's a completely Iraqi, indigenous, and supported organization. Um, it's Caliph Abu Omar al-Baghdadi, I'll talk about later. But he's instrumental in, in the process of rehabilitating the organization after their defeat to their own Sunni rivals, the Sawa. 
Uh, there's a 38-page document in 2007, which is available on the West Point CTC site. It's a, called the Analysis of the ISI, the Islamic State of Iraq, which is what it was called. And they criticize themselves for rigidity of doctrine and need, the need to change the organization and need to le learn to control territory. That was their biggest weakness and their lesson learned, engage the population, but also control the territory. Um, as a result, Abu Omar al-Baghdadi, along with Abu Hamza, who was the military commander of the Islamic State at the time, constructed the Dignity um, Campaign of 2008 and the Harvest of the Good Campaign of 2009, which targeted Sawa, which are Sunni awakening again, Shia militias, and go government forces within the rural villages that used to comprise their core areas that they were kicked out of in 2006 through 2008. They also called it Campaign Against the Traitors. And I'm, and I'm sure that's accidental, but it does show you that they're using a very similar methodology. And some of this is the influence, I think, of Abu Musab al-Suri. So the methods of my research, to get into some of the uh, actual graphs that I'll show you, I looked at the Islamic State movement statements from 2008 to 13. Each province provided an operational summary monthly, all right, which is available. Um, on jihadist websites, but also the U.S. government collects these things, translates them, and um, you see the activity, and you can measure, really, the targeting philosophy and methodology. I sampled four locations of core areas, and I'll show you those four locations here. There are four different locations. I sampled the monthly samples in, per in four different locations within these monthly summaries from 2008 to 13 in four different provinces with four different size populations and a different sectarian demographic in each. Um, the, I, the capture docs, I also used uh, Islamic State capture docs from the CRRC, which is the Capture Records Research Center, which was at National Defense University, but it's been closed due to sequestration. So at the time where we need this information the most, unfortunately, it's unavailable and it's been closed. Um, so the four places I chose, um, we'll start with Jerf in the south, Jerf sucker is a small village along the Euphrates River, all Sunni, but it's on the, on the border of what is known in Iraq as the Shia South. So you have sectarian dynamics in the sense that right next door is um, a predominantly majority Shia population. Uh, you have Garma, which is just outside of the famous city of Fallujah. It's a little bit larger city. It is all Sunni as well. However, it's safe in a safely Sunni province. It's almost so for, for looking at different variables that could affect this, it's in a very safe Sunni province. Then you have Bakaba, which is in a mixed sectarian area. It's the province capital of Diyala. Uh, it's a much bigger city, 200 plus thousand, uh, but it's divided sec, uh, from a sectarian basis. Um, and that, there's a lot of Shia militia activity in there. So there's a lot of question um, from a lot of different people is who exactly killed off the Sawa? How did the Sawa or the Sunni awakening movement how was it killed in Iraq? And it's often pointed to as the critical failing in allowing the resurgence of the Islamic State. Um, a lot of accusations, or at least some, and some fairly well grounded, that, that this is caused by political actions by the Maliki administration at the time. Right. And then finally, there's Mosul, which everyone's familiar with. It's a two million plus city. It is mostly Sunni, but they have a different sectarian element in the Kurdish factor in the north. Um, so you have four different locations, and that's my sampling. I'll get into the Iraqi body count. I use this as a benchmark. These, these uh, are, um, this is a scrape, if you will, of Sunnis who were killed and reported through morgue reports and through the news. So it's co double corroborated through that. But we don't know who killed them. It's very generic, just these, these people were killed. These are victims of violence, and they were identified as Sawa members. Right. You can see that 2008, when the awakening movement is still establishing itself, that the violence against Sawa is very strong, most likely by the Islamic State, but it's hard to tell, at least from this perspective. Uh, but you can see the violence is continual as well, which gives lie to a lot of the kind of self-congratulatory discussions that, uh, you know, that, are, that the problems in Iraq were fixed in 2007-8 and that they resurge in 2000. Well, after 2010, after a contested election, and then further on uh, due to sectarian nature, there's, there's actually a significant, consistent violence throughout. Um, but we don't know who, who did it. 
So I looked at the Islamic State's claims, um, which are not paid attention to significantly, unfortunately. Um, so I looked at their claims and I compared it to the benchmark simply and using descriptive statistics. Uh, and what I found was a rough correlation. The Islamic State over this period in Jerfa Sucker claimed, came, claimed to have killed 46 Salah members. Um, the benchmark, the actual number that were killed, and that's an underreport because those bodies have been found and processed through morgues and, and shown up in newspaper reports, uh, local newspaper reports <coughs> in Iraq. 55 over the same period of time. And you can see it's a normal distribution that the pattern, it begins slowly, it picks up speed, and then at a certain point, it tails off. And my, my uh, an analysis of this is that the, the campaign against the local government sympathizers, i.e. the Sawa, is complete. Notice the date, 2011, it's complete. After that, Jerfa Sucker is known as an Islamic State dominated area. If you look at Garma, and again, these were highly contested locations and, and really hot spots, if you will, from 2003 to 2007 uh, from all news reports and accounts. Garma, which is still Islamic State controlled, by the way, today, uh, and it's just uh, maybe 20, 30 miles outside of Baghdad. Um, you can see there's a very, there's a high, again, another high amount of killings claimed by the Islamic State early on in the campaign when they were, when they were uh, on the way out when the Islamic State was losing. And then a very quiet campaign in Anbar until the end. Uh, and my explanation for this would be that the, the, and the awakening movement originates in Anbar province. It's a safely Sunni area, and they're very comfortable, and they have decent control. This is probably the strongest awakening movement that exists in Iraq. The other ones were slightly, um, you know, bandwagon effect and, and somewhat copycats, all right? Um, but you can see at the end there's a spike when Anbar falls, and you see Anbar falls. Uh, good, good chunks of Anbar fall in the, in the, at the end of 2013, well before Mosul, by the way. Bakaba was, a, was, a, was an area that I had trouble uh, collecting data for, despite the regularity and the, the almost military efficiency, and the military is probably a good word to use, military efficiency of the Islamic State's media campaign and their, their diligence in reporting their claims of violence and what they're doing to their, uh, their enemies, even Sunni enemies of theirs, the traitors. Um, you can, in Bakaba, I was missing 32 months out of 72. So this is problematic um, from a data perspective. However, even missing half the data, you still see a, strong, a, a, a decently strong correlation between what the Islamic State is claiming at the time. Um, and certainly, uh, in my paper, I talk about news reports that do validate this particular campaign against the Sawa throughout Diyala province. Um, the problem is, again, Diyala has a lot of Shia militias, so with missing this data, this is a little bit inconclusive. But the violence in Bakuba is higher than anywhere else against the Sawa, and it's fairly, it's fairly consistent throughout this period. 2008, of course, is a blip. You see that's really the fight between the Sawa and the Islamic State movement with United States support and coalition support in between. Um, and, but then after that, it's fairly, fairly, uh, you can see the, the trends, they're following each other, but it's, it's kind of random. Bakaba I really can't understand or super explain to you, um, but, I could, but I could tell you that for the, at least for half of the reports that I was able to collect on this period, the Islamic State claims about half of the killings. So if you extrapolate, it's quite possible that they are, again, the, uh, the proponents or the, uh, the executors of this violence. And then finally, Mosul. Now, if you notice, Mosul is a city of two million. The awakening activity and the counter-awakening activity is almost nothing. It's almost nothing the entire time. There's never an awakening movement. There's never a pro-government movement. There's never a reconciliation movement of Sunnis in Mosul to the government. So you don't have a counter-awakening uh, campaign. In fact, the early documents that I could see in the captured records Go to 2007, their governance documents from the Islamic State of Iraq in the, in the province of Nineveh. So you have quite a bit of state building. Again, the idea, going back to revolutionary warfare, they've always been interested in, in, a sta in, in declaring this particular state. Um, to show you that Mosul isn't a, an oasis of peace, though, you can see in the bottom there's three times as many attacks in, Nineveh, in Mosul, specifically Mosul, 
uh, I'm sorry, that should be Nineveh province, as compared to um, if you look at Diyala province, which I just said was a very violent place, yet Nineveh province has three times the, uh, the violence generically. So it's just, it's violence directed at the Iraqi security forces uh, predominantly. And then finally, to show you the nature of the attacks, I looked again at all four different places and tried to characterize what type of attacks they were. They're all assassinations, close kill, people going into people's houses in the middle of the night, um, great intelligence from the local community. So this is an organization that has the ability to operate within these rural areas very well and has sympathy of the population to do so. Uh, and, and you see they're also targeting all of the leadership. So half of all of these assassinations are directed at the leadership of the Sunnis who were pro-government. And what you see there is um, the hope that they can co-op the rest of the Sunni, the, the, the basic, the, the, the low-level personnel in the organization and get them to come over, which was a good assumption, I think, because that's who probably rounds out most of the Islamic State today, their, for, their, their forces. Um, so you can see, you know, just different uh, trends in here about the bottom lines. It's, it's very close and personal action, and it's done with exceptional intelligence, which is problematic from a, from a regular warfare perspective. And then finally, I, I compared the, the top graph is total casualties. The bottom one is the Sawa particular part of it. So the total is these Iraqi security forces, police and military in Jerfasucker in particular. And the bottom one is the Sawa, okay? And what you see there is once they focus almost exclusively on the Sawa early on to eliminate any collaborators and informants, and then once that's safely done, notice this is all done before 2010. This is before the political grievance theory that, you know, the, that this group uh, is inspired by, you know, Prime Minister Maliki's um, sectarian behavior. You've got um, indications that, th that this campaign is well underway and fairly successful because by the time they, sh they, they shift their focus from the local collaborators to the Iraqi security forces and use mortars, and improvised explosive devices, which are, which are a little more time consuming and, and more o open activity. And you see this, the, the casualties in the security forces skyrocket as they lose control of the countryside. Uh, at the very end, the division commander of this entire area is killed along with 10 of his other people, which shows you not just the sophistication, but the intelligence that this particular organization has in the, in the local area. And I'll leave you with this. I had a lot of interesting documents that I was able to really post engagement reports from somebody who was charged to actually go out and engage the Sunni tribal leaders. And it's interesting if you look at some of the aspects uh, of the discussion in the post engagement reports, and I'll let you read those. But the, the keys are, you know, the Sunni, the Sunni tribal leaders don't have a from a social movement perspective or even looking at, they don't have a particular desire to reconcile with the government, even though that's our understanding after 2008. They never do. From a social identity perspective, they identify themselves as a particular group and they don't see themselves as being part of a government as they, as they claim here, as part of al Qami state, which is a reference to the, the demise of the Abbasid Empire, all right? So they don't see themselves as that. Um, and you see the Sunni tribal leaders saying, you know, the next time you guys, in your comeback, make sure you do these activities in order to better integrate with this society. But that's the population support, all right? And then finally, all of this takes place under Abu Omar al-Baghdadi. So the, all the books are written about Abu Musab al-Zarqawi, the charismatic leader, and all the newspaper articles are written about Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi, the famous, you know, or infamous, or um, supposed uh, scholar, Islamic scholar. Nothing is written about Abu Bakr al I mean, Abu Omar al Baghdadi, who's really orchestrating the campaign that I'm talking about, which is fairly successful. Um, it's an indication to me we don't have any idea what this group is about. Um, we really don't. And he has four different names at any given time. The United States military did not know he, who he was until he was elected the emir, and he was elected in a Shura Council discussion, we had no idea who he was and thought he was a, f a fake, as, a, as it says on here, a deception plan, 
in order to make the group look Iraqi. I promise you the group was Iraqi, and it was somewhat popular, mostly through the connections of the Salafi underground movement prior to the fall of Saddam. And they had been there for quite some time. Um, what are some of the lessons learned from that? Uh, one, those movements exist in quite a few countries, so probably ought to pay attention to that. Um, the idea of networks is very interesting to me. The Sunni awakening that I've been talking about is a network itself, but it's a very discombobulated network. It's a network of both former resistance groups of diverse types, Sunni tribes, which are connected to some people but not other tribes, versus the Islamic State, which is an overlapping group of networks of some former regime members, but mostly the Salafi network that I talked about that existed in Iraq prior to 2003. It's also people who've come out of Camp Bucca, the prison systems. So we had a discussion about the rule of law prior to this. Uh, Marie had some great points. In Western societies, in, in uh, Iraq, w what happened is the group is able to regenerate due to some very misguided ideas about uh, really conflict termination. Uh, as well as reconciliation, some really poor reconciliation um, efforts that really regenerate the group and at a great cost, again, as Marie said, to human security because of all of these people that were killed afterwards. As she said, the retaliation against traitors when it's allowed to happen in an area that doesn't have rule of law is very problematic. Uh, so we can learn stuff from that. Um, and I'll leave it at that and for any of the questions because I'm sure I've, I've gone long. Think, right, probably. I could talk forever on this stuff. So. Thanks, Professor Whiteside. Thank you. Thank you very much. And ne next, we're going to hear from Dr. Englund. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm from UC Santa Barbara and from the Orfila Center. And uh, as uh, Michael Stoll and Richard Birchall and I were putting together the program, we ordered the speakers. I was able to do that, which was fun. And we tried to provide contrast and, and really dynamic agenda. So in the first panel, you had these, a panel of preeminent scholars, a really disciplined academic research, very sophisticated uh, statistics, and now you have me. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll get into it. What, uh, what I'm trying to present today is a comparative project uh, that uh, looks at three different groups that aren't often compared, although two maybe are. But um, So we're, we're supposed to be talking about well, the so-called Islamic State, and, and now sometimes called Daesh. Um, and I'm going to compare it to uh, a movement called the Sendero Luminoso, or the Shining Path in Peru, and then Al-Shabaab uh, that uh, operate, operated and operates in, in Somalia. So I figure I have three uh, tasks, three jobs uh, to do in this presentation uh, in order to make it successful. Uh, the first would be to why compare these three groups at all and, and why to do it in this way. Uh, and then uh, to, uh, secondly, try to make some uh, good and helpful comparisons between these groups. So um, once we've established that it's actually a good thing to do, then maybe uh, prove that there is something to learn from it. Uh, and then, uh, as we've been told by the, the topic of the, the conference, is to confront the, the challenges that's presented by this organization, uh, then to describe maybe how it might end, uh, and then uh, what maybe are some strategies that could uh, help it along the way. Um, so uh, to begin, uh, why study these three groups? Uh, why do this comparative study at all? Well, first of all, is that if you read a lot of uh, academic writing, and if you, and if you definitely read uh, uh, journalistic writing, then you'll find that uh, Islamic State is, is most often compared to Al-Qaeda. Uh, it's sort of ideological uh, progenitor, so where it kind of came from, and its uh, main, I would say, rival in the, in the jihadist world. Um, so let's not do that. Uh, it's been done. Uh, let's try something different. Um, so why Sendero Luminoso? Why uh, Al-Shabaab? Well, both the, all three of these groups, um, I'd like to advance, held territory at some point. They all three acted as an insurgency that used terror as a tool. Um, they all had um, sort of revolutionary political goals, uh, such that uh, they were maybe inspired initially uh, by localized grievances, and definitely that's what was used to recruit people to those movements. Uh, but they also had uh, the global and revolutionary goals uh, that, that, that I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about. 
And the, these, these movements were born of a widespread dissatisfaction in the communities, uh, and that dissatisfaction was laid at the foot of either a totally collapsed government or a, a government that was seen as corrupt and ineffective. All right, so if, just getting down into this, as I was uh, reading it, I didn't really uh, begin uh, the project thinking about social movement theory and revolutions and Ted Gurr and uh, Theta Scotch Paul and all those people that wrote about all that stuff, but it, it really started to fit well. Uh, and that we find that, that the, the people that were writing about why do people rebel why do people uh, who have a political motive, why do they turn to violence, um, that all of that seemed to fit well uh, with these groups. And, it, and, it, and it, made, it made them make sense to me in a, in a theoretical sense. So I think I've got a decent theoretical footing for, uh, for proceeding. All right, so let's do the comparisons then. Um, I think I'm gonna go a little short, but that's all right. Everybody, I'm standing between you and lunch. Um, so the comparisons are, uh, first let's start with uh, the Islamic State and, and Daesh, and I'll, and I'll describe what I think are three ways uh, that, that these groups are really similar. And one I've talked about already is that both have uh, a local and global political goals. Um, so I'll, I'll pull one quote that um, is very interesting to me, it, in that the Sendero Luminoso, or the, the Shining Path, had a, a almost a millenarian uh, outlook, is that they were the vanguards of a global revolution. Uh, uh, Guzman himself returned, uh, referred to himself as the fourth sword of, uh, of the global revolution. So uh, first was uh, you know, Marx, uh, then Lenin, uh, then Mao, and then Guzman. Right? So Guzman was the perfection of all of those that, that preceded him. So here's, here's a little quote that I really like, and you know, see if you can't be inspired by it. The trumpets begin to sound, the roar of the masses grows and will continue to grow. It will deafen us. It will take us into a powerful vortex. We will convert the black fire into red and the red into light. This we shall do. This is the rebirth. Comrades, we are reborn. All right, so that's how he concluded the first meeting of uh, the, the military committee of the Politburo of his organization. So that's pretty inspiring. And you don't read anything in there, except for maybe you can say, oh, comrades, it's kind of kind of red. Uh, but, and he does say red and red into light, but that's about it. It could have been used in any other situation where you're trying to inspire people to do some kind of violence. Um, and that brings us to the second point, is that violence is inherent to their cause. Right? So Guzman believed and really tried to to inspire his people that the only way that you can work this revolution is through violence. Um, and that's the same for the other groups as, as well, is that the only way that we can, we can achieve our goals is to do violence because the system itself that we're working in, uh, it doesn't work for us, right? So we're, we're kind of the product of this environment. Uh, we feel dissatisfied with what this is. Therefore, we need to do violence, and it's the only way to go. Um, and finally, and I've t maybe hinted at this, is that they view themselves uh, as ideologically pure, as a, as a redemption of prior uh, errors. Um, and this feeds into the Salafism that, uh, that motivates both the Islamic State, uh, Daesh, and al-Shabaab, uh, that they are the perfectors of this, of prior errors, as I understand it. And then, of course, Guzman's idea that, that he's perfecting uh, Mao. Uh, in fact, he, he uh, ladled derision equally on the United States, on Europe, on the Soviet Union, and on uh, communist China under Deng Xiaoping. Uh, so you can see that there's this ideological uh, a purity that, that happens. So that's the comparison I want to make between Islamic State uh, and the others, and that I think that that's, those are three uh, things that, that they share. Uh, so then I'm going to tell the story briefly of uh, rather than go into the whole story about Islamic State, because I think that um, if you're here and you're interested in it, you've probably heard that story before, so, and there's been a lot of work uh, on it that's, that's very current, uh, actually, uh, so I'm not going to get into that right now. But the other two stories may not be as familiar, um, and uh, I'll admit that the, the story of The Shining Path wasn't very familiar to me when I, when I started out on this, but I found that it was really fascinating. Um, so. In Peru, in the, in the late 
in the 1970s, it was governed by a military dictatorship that had taken power uh, in 1967, I believe. Um, late in the 1970s, um, that military dictatorship was facing a lot of uh, demonstrations and a lot of political protest, and uh, the leaders decided that they would democratize slowly. So they opened up in uh, 1980 uh, a parliamentary system with, uh, with uh, democratic elections. Now, it didn't, it didn't function perfectly, uh, and it wasn't, uh, wasn't precisely what we would call democratic, uh, but it, it was an opening. Uh, that was in 1980. Uh, the military government uh, at the time was, was actually uh, fairly left, um, and it was, uh, endorsed by, uh, it was endorsed by Castro. It was supported by the Soviet Union. Uh, and so uh, it, the left in, in Peru had a, a good base to grow. And some of the parties, uh, the legitimate parties of the left, they would call themselves then, they went into politics. So they decided to form political parties. They stood for election and a lot of them won. Uh, the exception was uh, the group that was led by, by Guzman. Uh, and uh, he decided that, uh, well, he, he was often quoted as saying that d uh, democratic elections don't work for us, so therefore we, we need to do something different. And so they entered in, in 1980 what they called uh, the armed resistance, or the, the beginning of armed uh, resistance. Um, <clears throat> It, it took them about three years, and then they, they started to actually attack, uh, kill uh, union leaders, uh, leaders of parties of the left. Uh, and so they were kind of preying on, on people that you would think would be ideological partners in their, in their mission. Uh, but again, they, they, they saw them as traitors. They saw them as people that were selling out or that they, that they, they were buying into a system that was inherently corrupt and couldn't possibly uh, serve them. Um, how did uh, it end? How did the Shining Path come to a conclusion? Um, well, first you can say it's not, it's, it's not done because uh, <clears throat> there are some remnant organizations uh, that exist uh, in, in kind of the, the rural, very rural areas uh, of, of uh, Peru. And so it, it, it still goes on, but it's, it's nothing of what it was in the 1980s or, or early 90s. <clears throat> so how did it really end? Um, I don't have a graph to show you, but really there was there were about uh, 150 attacks every year in 1992. Guzman was captured in 1992 in the late part of the year. The following year there were about uh, 40. Uh, so it really dropped down dramatically. So first off, it ended because uh, the Peruvian government made a little intelligence coup, and, and were, they were able to capture Guzman and his wife. They tried him and they put him in prison and he's still in prison. Uh, the second thing is that the government, especially under the, the, the government of Alberto Fujimori, or Fujimori, I guess is how you pronounce it in Peru, uh, really actively repressed the population in the area in which uh, they operated. So uh, there was some very deep uh, government activity there uh, that they killed a lot of people, they killed a lot of innocent mm -hmm. people, and they really acted uh, quite ruthlessly in, in that part of the the country. Uh, and lastly, you could say, uh, well, that, that denied them a base of support, essentially. So it squeezed them until they really couldn't operate. They finally captured the last person that was a member of the Central Politburo uh, in 2012, so very recently. Um, <clears throat> the third thing is that uh, Shining Path uh, alienated the, the Peruvian people uh, themselves, because a lot of their victims were just ordinary Peruvians uh, that the Shining Path at least claimed that they were carrying on this revolution for. Um, so they turned against the people that, would, that, that were their supporters. And uh, they were really, really, really violent in the way they did it. Uh, and so they, the people just became disgusted with them. Um, there's a couple quotes about just them being, one person described it as being ornery, you know, the orneriness of uh, the organization. Uh, that they were ideologically rigid, uh, that they, they couldn't uh, modify their views in order to ensure survival. Uh, so the three of those combined really made it go away, essentially, with maybe a few remnants of operating. Now, uh, the capture of Guzman, denial of their area of operations, uh, in which they, they saw themselves as a, as, a, as a guerrilla operation. They worked as a guerrilla army. Guerrilla armies need a base of support from which to operate. Um, and that once that was denied, they, didn't, they couldn't operate. And finally, they alienated the proving people.
And so that's, that's the shining path. Um, um, so with that, we have an interesting way that we can look at where it started, kind of how it began, the situation in which it began, and then maybe how it, how it ended. Um, I'm sorry, send an arrow. Al-Shabaab, on the other hand, um, is ideologically very similar uh, to uh, Daesh or the Islamic State. Uh, they both uh, carry a, a, a Salafist uh, belief system, a Salafi jihadi uh, uh, strain. Uh, they practice the uh, takfir in which they, they, they say that other Muslims are not Muslims because of what they believe. Um, so uh, ideologically, they're very similar. Um, they're, they're very similar in their origins as well, that they both sort of emanated out of uh, Al-Qaeda and the resistance in Afghanistan uh, and leadership and both organizations served in Afghanistan and came and, and, and into those different things. Um, but there, there are some important differences that we can't overlook. Um, one is that um, al-Shabaab uh, doesn't have a Guzman at its head. Uh, there was a person uh, by the last name of Godan uh, that was killed three years ago, I think, that served as its leader, but he was, had nowhere the charismatic leadership of, of Guzman. He was, Guzman was almost a cult figure in that, in, in the Sendero organization movement. Um, but that doesn't exist there. Uh, the organization is also very different, of course. Al-Shabaab is a very loose organization. It's, it's got lots of little cells. It's got lots of tribes. The politics of, of Somalia don't lend itself to a really centralized organization. Whereas the Shining Path was a very classically uh, communist organization with very central leadership that had little subcommittees. It was very highly organized and communicated really well. It was very uh, rigid in how it communicated its, um, its ideology and its plans. Um, so those are, those are some Im important uh, uh, differences, I, I think. Um, <clears throat> so the similarities, though, uh, I think that we find them in, in all three, but I'll highlight a few, is that um, there were some political opportunities that gave rise to this organization. So that's the social movement theory seeping back in, is that once you have this political change or some big movement or, or big um, uh, uh, revolutionary change uh, in, in government, then these other organizations that previously couldn't find political output then find a way uh, to express themselves. Uh, and so that happened both in Peru with the opening up of democracy, kind of a changing of a, of a political system, and then it happened, uh, unfortunately, in Somalia with the complete collapse of, of the government in 1991. Uh, these parties also uh, both, they, they presented new solutions to the problems that were presented by this collapse. Uh, so the collapse of a corrupt government in Somalia was replaced by what was supposed to be a new just government that was providing security, et cetera. Um, and then they all, uh, they all three uh, provide services to the local population so that they were able to endear themselves to the locals by doing basic things like generating electricity, paving roads, uh, opening up schools, things like that. So those are the similarities. All right, so that's the, the middle meat of the story. Uh, so I've told you a little bit about what, 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 how, why I study these groups. There's some interesting similarities and differences. I told you the story of, of the three. And so hopefully this may inform us a bit on how, how this story ends for uh, the Islamic State or Daesh. Um, so we've concluded uh, that uh, Daesh will continue to exist as what we call a traditional uh, terrorist threat um, uh, for some time, uh, even if it's denied its area of operations, even if it's... Um, uh, if, it, if it no longer can call itself a caliphate or a state, um, and even if you kill off its, its leadership. Um, so why is that? Um, the Islamic State has some characteristics that encourage uh, persistence, we think. Um, and the first of that is that they do believe that they are on the precipice of the end times. If you read their documents, and you know, I'm learning Arabic, I, I know the, I'm learning the alphabet, so I'm basically a, a baby. Um, but uh, hey, you know, I'm trying. All right, so um, that, that it, it encourages persistence because they believe that they're at the end of the world. Uh, the own, so therefore, they're, if they're on the right side of that, which of course they are, uh, there's no way they can lose. Um, so that's, that's one really important, dangerous thing that will allow them to persist in their, in their objectives. Um, <clears throat> and then the other is that uh, they have this really strong uh, sentiment of sectarianism against the Shia. Um, 
So uh, that makes them dangerous in that they're not likely to feel that they're ever going to lose, and it makes them dangerous in that there's a huge population that's right around them that are fairly convenient targets for their violence. Um, so that's, that's one, one bad thing. The second thing is that, as we said, is that uh, decapitation is not likely to work in this case. Right, so you killed Guzman. Guzman was a cult figure that had this millenarian and goals that gave these really beautiful speeches. Uh, but um, even though uh, uh, the, the self-proclaimed the self caliph, uh, Abu Bakr um, al-Baghdadi, uh, believes himself uh, to, to be a caliph, and he's very well educated, and he's very eloquent, um, in their own ideology, the person that leads the caliphate at the end times is not as important as, the, as what's going to happen in the future. So uh, according to their own ideology, he's not as important as what follows. He's basically there to make sure that um, what is said is supposed to happen is actually going to happen according to plan. Um, and finally, we, we think that um, the um, social and political conditions that gave rise to this organization, this particular organization, uh, will persist. Uh, uh, so the deeply sectarian um, divisions, um, the, the, the chaos that was the result of, these, of the US invasion and then the civil war in Syria, um, and then the, the, the will, will likely to persist. And these have probably been exacerbated. Um, so that's, uh, that, that's the, the last reason, is that <clears throat> We find that even though al-Shabaab, and I forgot to sort of tell the end of the story of al-Shabaab, was that even though it had a territory, it was fairly successful, it was able to tax people, it, it fought battles well. Uh, it doesn't do that anymore, but it still commits violence um, in, in aid of its goals. Um, uh, because the, the conditions that inspire people to do those violent things are still there. Uh, and, and that exists to some extent in Peru. Uh, so you have st small, low levels of violence, even though it was mainly guided by that one, uh, one clever person. Um, so that's the, the conclusion is that um, it'll, it'll persist as, as a while. So even though we may try to, to kill the leadership and we may try to, to uh, it, maybe it's military loss is inevitable, uh, it, it's still going to persist. So uh, that got me to think about what other ideological battles have we, have we had. And um, this is the part that I was told that maybe would be controversial by my boss. But um, <laughs> so um, I, I, I was thinking about containment. Um, and the people talk about containing um, the Islamic State, the so-called Islamic State. And so uh, who else to think about when you think about containment than George uh, Kennan? right, in 1947. So he wrote that, that famous uh, article uh, under the pseudonym X in uh, Foreign Affairs, uh, 1947, like in the winter sign. And, and some of it, I reread it, and, and a lot of it echoed, I think, with what we think about and what I was just writing about with, with these three groups. Um, so uh, one thing he wrote about of the, the leaders of the Soviet Union um, is that subjectively these men, the Soviet leaders, probably did not seek absolutism for its own sake. They doubtlessly believed and found it easy to believe that they alone knew what was good for society and that they would accomplish that good once their power was secure and unchallengeable. Right, so we find that, that that fits kind of with what we hear uh, from Abu Bakr al-Baghdadi. I mean, after all, uh, he, he did take the name of the first of, of those that are called the rightly guided caliphs. And that that's not his name. He, he took that, of course, intentionally to, to, to give a message. Um, and, so, and, and also, we, we hear this in, in al-Shabaab, and we also hear this from, from, uh, from Daesh. Uh, uh, Kennan wrote, the leadership of the Communist Party is therefore always right, and has always been right ever since 1929. Stalin formalized his personal power by announcing that decisions of the Politburo were being taken unanimously. On the principle of infallibility, there rests the iron discipline of the Communist Party. Like the church, it is dealing in, an ideologi in ideological concepts which have long-term validity and it can, uh, it can afford to be patient. Uh, so again, we're in, in locked in, in a, in, as we are with Daesh, it's sort of an end of the world ideological struggle. We can't expect that they'll just sort of give up and say, my goodness, uh, one, that we give up because you're so strong, or two, we give up because you're so right, um, is that, um, uh, that, that we can't 
and can't really take that seriously. And then he talks a little bit about what made me think about American politics today. He said that um, disunity is a balm to one's opponents in an ideological battle, right? He said, by the same token, exhibition of indecision, disunity, and internal disintegration within this country, the United States, uh, have an exhilarating effect abroad. Right? So that's that. All right, so Cannon writing about a completely different thing a long time ago. So I can't really take that all that seriously. Um, so yeah, uh, intervening years have shown that Kennan's read of the Soviet aggressiveness was, was exaggerated and, and probably wasn't all that right. Uh, but you know, we have to put him in his, in his own historical context and where he was working. And arguably, it's not possible, it may not be possible, some argue that it is, may not be possible to deter an organization like the Islamic State, just like the Soviet Union. Um, but we're really talking about containing it and not deterring it in this case. Um, so, you know, uh, what, what lessons did Kennan uh, draw from this is that swagger, grand gestures, he called them fruitless engagements, these were contraindicated for that, that struggle. Um, and instead, persistent containment, positive example, uh, negative consequences for bad behavior, and uh, unified action and harmony were all advised. All right. uh, so, um, so therefore, what we might draw from that is that open warfare um, isn't really going to work in this case. Uh, is that instead just sort of being persistently, um, you know, in opposition, which is what uh, Kennan would say, uh, was the was the way to to go. Thus, you can't carpet bomb the Islamic State in, out of existence because uh, that would probably uh, feed into its its objectives in some state. Um, so. Um, as Kennan advised, I guess the longer the rest of the world can deny them, the Islamic State, any semblance of victory and lay bare their own contradictions, then the end of this particular group is achievable through patient, thoughtful opposition and defense. So uh, I guess that's a period. Thank you very much. Finishing with a decisive X. I'm, I'm intrigued having heard both these panels, and I want this discussion uh, to involve the participants, many of whom are presenters in the room. Um, as someone who studied revolutions and, and terrorism and then became a practitioner with years uh, in the White House and the State Department and the Pentagon, I'm, I'm struck by two, uh, by some, if not competing, uh, different points of emphasis in the first panel and the second panel. Um, and so it begs some questions which I hope you'll think about and maybe ask and comment about. Um, if We've seen academic emphasis on, on data. We've heard discussion of whether military responses are effective. Uh, we've seen the proposition that law enforcement and prison could be uh, a more fruitful way to respond uh, to this uh, modern version of anarchy um, at then, uh, than force. Um, and we've heard different sort of views on what constitutes appropriate expertise. Here we've just heard something which I think gives you a sense of um, a little bit of the disciplines and the tradecraft that you hear within the Pentagon, the military, and the FBI, for example, where, uh, where there is uh, a great deal of focus on doctrine, on, on historical evolution of warfare, on tradecraft, on organizational um, uh, dynamics of, of, of threatening groups, and I think you've seen that. Not a lot, not a huge reliance on data, more on philosophy, uh, history, tradecraft, comparative politics. So I invite the group to uh, opine on these matters and to ask and to draw our panelists out and to carry this kind of open question further into subsequent panels. Uh, I would note that a lot of reference to Salafism Said Qutb wrote his 13-volume opus uh, in, in Nasser's prison, um, and uh, the Paris bombers uh, apparently were second-generation immigrants to France um, who uh, were radicalized in jail. And so I just let's let's have a let's have some questions. Let's. Hi, Alex Sanchez, right for sorry, uh, IHSG and Defense Weekly now and then. I'm originally from Peru, so I appreciate the shout out to Shanin Pav. Um, 
two, two quick things the coup that uh, happened that brought in the military government was actually in 68 with Juan Velasco Alvarado, not uh, 67. My question is, when it comes to Shining Path, we always called it a messianic organization. Uh, it was them and nobody else. Not they fought against the government, the military, the church, you know, they were, where they were Protestants or, or Catholics, they were all killed um, because they were against the ideology. I'm curious if that's a term that can be applied to ISIS or Al-Shabaab. Uh, I know this is more of a discussion on semantics, but I'm curious like, when it comes to um, like their, their ultimate goal, how, how much wiggle room there is to partner with organizations. Just as a final point, in, in Peru, there was another terrorist organization, the MRTA, who were communist Marxist, compared to, as compared to Shining Path, which was Maoist Leninist. And apparently, there's a big difference. And they, they, they actually fought against each other. Uh, there, were no, there was no kind of alliance or anything like that. I'm curious, especially when it comes to Al Shabaab, if there's that, that situation as well. Thank you. The idea of ideological purity, I think, is the important, is that um, all, th all three of these organizations, two of them share, closely share one an ideology, but then comparing them to, um, to the shining path is that, yeah, they, they, Guzman believed himself to be the purification of, of Marxism, right? So that, that everybody else had done it wrong, uh, basically, and that he was going to correct the problems and really do it the right way. And, and because he was going to do it the right way, uh, he was going to be successful, and the, the vision of a global uh, revolution would be possible. It's right? so a way down the road, of course, but um, that, that, that's really important in that regard. Um, I, what I've read of, of al-Shabaab is that there is a lot of infighting in that organization, that, they're very, that they, they do operate against each other. Um, so um, you, can't, you can't really directly compare these groups, um, you know, even though I, I just told you I, I wanted to. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> but I think that the, uh, the, that the the, the, really what we're, what we're driving at is that there are some differences that hopefully illuminate um, uh, you know, what, how the story ends. That was kind of the goal. So. Well, I'd like to just address the Islamic State part of that. You know, um, Abu Musab al-Zarqawi was a rigid ideologist, and we did the organization a favor by killing him. Now, I'm not saying that, right, that it, that was not the right thing to do, or, but, it, but my argument, as I tried to present, was that you had Abu Omar al-Baghdadi, an Iraqi, who was able to knit the group back together as well as expand its base and take rejection people who are not going to reconcile back with the government so they are learning and if you look the their original concept was to transform the tribes which which is a silly very rigid ideological idea right R transform the tribes of iraq they after 2008 they steal an idea on their account from the americans and that's to co-opt the tribes and to basically engage, and they create a tribal engagement office. If you look at the tables of organization before and after 2008, there's actually a tribal engagement office added in 2008. And I, g I gave you one example of that tribal engagement. So that's flexibility. That's not rigidity. That's learning. And that's problematic from, from an analytical perspective is a group that's learning um, and fixing their flaws. And I would argue is why they're successful today. So a great question. Are I you think. suggesting that General Petraeus is one of their mentors. Um, I, I, there's a lot of laudatory. There was a, one particular one, and I think it's from the document I mentioned, the, the analysis of the ISI on the CTC website. But it said the Americans have become the insurgents, and you're, I mean that's pretty powerful from insurgents. I mean they're being self-critical and probably a little overly self-critical, but they said the Americans somehow became the insurgents, and we're the rigid ones. We need to change, and I, I mean not. Again, I don't like reading that. And that's for 2007, by the way. Interesting. Hi, uh, Nancy O'Kale, Tahrir Institute for Middle East Policy. Um, Scott, I may have missed the first uh, slides that you had, but I was wondering if you had a comparison between the number of ISIS fighters compared to the number of um, Iraqis that have been killed, or, or generally if you had any comparison between the different sides, because some people would interpret the relative difference in size with the relative small number of the ISIS fighters as sort of an acceptance from the, the places that we are. And I was wondering what your um, comment on that. And also another uh, question for um, Craig, I mean, particularly about your comments about the uh, elimination of the leadership and how would this affect the organizations and, uh, and those groups, particularly given 
uh, the description of Ambassador Bloomfield about this is modern day anarchy because some of the groups actually take pride and try to position themselves that they are an organized army and organized governance with hierarchy and, and, and rules of governance. So I was wondering how would that fit and if you agree with this description that is the modern day anarchy. Thank you. So I gave you a small example on the last slide of, of how they engaged the, the tribes. And what, what was disturbing to me was I came at the research under the understanding that this is a coercive organization that's forcing people to be part of its, you know, that they kind of jump on the bandwagon. This, that's the common narrative. They jump on the bandwagon of a Sunni resistance movement against their own government. And they're really parallel movements. But as I was describing the depth and the roots of this organization within the culture. I, I mean, my only conclusion from reading, uh, not just not looking at the data, but also reading the, the, po the tribal engagement reports from the Islamic State commander who was tasked with going and talking to each Sunni tribesman very humbly with gifts in hands and asking for forgiveness and what to do next, that there's a receptiveness to that, unfortunately. And, and probably, so there, so, you know, I don't know for sure, and I don't think anyone knows, and I'm not sure the United States, we tend to focus on foreign fighters because we're worried about them coming back to our, our areas. But in reality, the organization is an Iraqi, now Iraqi Syrian, with, with a good leavening of foreign fighters throughout for what we call foreign fighters, what they call brothers. And, and, and that distinction is lost on them where it's, it's not, it, it's, that distinction is important to us. It's, they, don't, they don't care about that distinction. So they do, I mean, they have strong support. And I think uh, there's a recent, there's some recent polling done, of course, it's problematic in Mosul, but that they have substantial support that's increased since our activities, as some of the, uh, our, our academics in the first panel talked about, that, that it's increased, that the support for, for, the, for the group from a poll that could be very suspect has increased. Well, what I, what I found in just these three stories is that um, in, in two of the cases, it, it didn't work all that well. Well, it, in one case it worked well, in one case it didn't work well. Uh, when Guzman was captured, um, uh, the, the organization almost stopped existing, and just a little bit left over. Um, and then when they killed Godan, which was supposed to be al-Shabaab's leader, uh, it, it, it still goes on, right? So they were, they were quickly replaced. There's some other research that shows, that, or that, that identifies uh, that, uh, well, when does this work? Uh, and uh, in strong ideological organizations, um, decapitation can work, uh, but in religious organizations, uh, it doesn't work. Um, so that's, that's just one piece of research that's out there by uh, Jenna Jordan in 2009 was the, the thing. Um, and then um, the other thing that, might, that, that I thought was interesting was that there's, there's two different ways that, that, that they decapitated the organization. In Guzman's case, they captured him, they tried him, and he's in prison. Um, since he's been in prison, in, in as, as early as 1993, he actually renounced violence. He said, stop, stop killing everybody, you know, just chill out. Um, uh, and he's, he's consistently said that. Um, the people that were captured later, uh, the, the original, uh, you know, uh, Politburo, the last one that was, or the second to last one that was captured, said, we've lost. Stop, right? This thing is over. Um, so there might be an interesting lesson there, is that capturing people might be better than killing them. Um, especially in the Salafi jihadi strain, is that you know if you're killed, you're martyred, and that's kind of that 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 keeps you in the fight in some sense. But if you're taken off the battlefield and put in prison, um, then you have an opportunity, uh, as in uh, um, uh, Guzman's uh, case, was to change his. So you had a question about uh, Ambassador Bloom, um, Bloomfield. Sorry, mm -hmm. sorry, yeah, Bloomfield's comment about anarchy. And I mean, these are state builders, so no. I mean, they're, they're anarchists in the sense they need to tear down the existing world order, if you will. And they, they reference that incessantly. Um, they reference the fall of the, the 2008 economic crisis in the United States as a signal of this impending failure of the world order. So they're, in that case, they're, they are trying to create anarchy in order to establish this utopian, I mean, which is fairly prevalent in the literature, so. Can I just interject a question? Yeah. So far, the question has been, what should we, the West, we, the U.S., do about these threatening groups? But, so, but right in the middle is the, the invisible factor is the local governments. And you talked a lot about the Iraqi, about Maliki, and about the Iraqi government itself. 
and the Army, we briefly mentioned, you said that when Peru opened up, uh, suddenly so the atmosphere changed and the, it wasn't as fertile an environment for a revolutionary movement. Um, what's, what's the message here about governance at the state level as, as these groups aspire to global uh, disruption uh, and have, have, have local but also global goals? Uh, what should Western governments in particular be taking away from this discussion with respect to um, lo local governance? Is that key to any wisdom here? Well, uh, you could quote to Tocqueville, I guess. Um, he said that, just sort of like paraphrase, the worst, the most dangerous time for a bad government is when it starts to reform itself. Uh, so that um, that was applied to, uh, that can really be applied to the military dictatorship in Peru, it was sort of a bad government, and then it decided to reform itself and it opened up the, the cracks a little bit which then gave that political space for, for, for people to act. And then unfortunately, uh, one group, well, the majority of the groups uh, decided to participate in that new government. Uh, one group decided that that wasn't for them and that that, wouldn't, that would never serve their purposes. So in that case, it went that way. Um, and in the, in the case of uh, Iraq, I don't, I don't know if, if they've begun to reform themselves. Um, so, you know, like, we've, I, like the conclusion of my, my paper, or it's our paper between, with uh, Michael here, was that um, the social and political uh, environment that gave rise to these organizations is likely to persist. Right? So if, those, if that persists, you know, it's kind of logical that you say, well, maybe reductionist, uh, is that it, 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 the violence is likely to persist as well, the motivation to carry on. They're attracted to failing states. This is no, but I mean, when Iraq, Zarqawi's focus, he's in Iraq prior to 2003, I think everybody knows he's there, but he's focused on Europe, actually, weirdly. I mean, I think he's still trying to figure it out. He's focused on Europe until we invade Iraq in 2003, and then he has a new focus and, an, and a very motivated focus. Um, he, and you see the same thing in Libya, as soon as Libya. I mean, that's why there's an Islamic State movement in Libya right now, that are their elements, and they have cadre there. They have key leaders that were there. One's an Iraqi, now he's a Tunisian. I mean, they, so they, they, but they go to the sound of falling states. And that's, that's a lesson that we're still trying to figure out, I think. Thanks, Risa Brooks, Marquette University. Um, I really love both of your efforts to sort of think about a different metaphor um, for what this movement is as a revolutionary movement. And so I have a couple questions, but the first broad one is, does thinking about it that way change what we do or local governments do in response? How does that change how we think about the solution or the policy implications of that? And then sort of more um, down in the weeds for Craig Whiteside, um, I, I think that sort of discussion about support and exploiting social networks and building and selective targeting, all that is really useful and a good corrective to the prevailing narrative of of the sort of brutality of the group. But what about the brutality of the group, right? That, you know, some of the beheadings are geared toward an international audience, but some of that is about population control and coercion. So how do we know they have substantial social support? You know, what, how do these do, these sort of coercive mechanisms work with the sort of more public appeals and public goods provision? Well, I was going to say, I thought, I, you know, you addressed quite, a, quite oh. a few of those throughout your, your talk. Well, uh, I could cop out and say that just like when I was an intelligence analyst, I say, well, I just gave you the information, you make the decision. Um, <laughs> um, but I guess I can't do that um, anymore. Uh, well, I, um, I think the containment issue is, is, is important to think about, is that um, you can't, if, if that organization, and we're talking about um, Islamic State Dash, if if that organization is going to persist after it's, it, it could be physically destroyed or, uh, and its leadership killed, um, uh, then it doesn't make a lot of sense to invest in, in a, a huge operation to do that, um, but rather than, to con rather than to try to contain it. Now, all right, so that might be unpopular uh, because um, that means that you're, you're, you could say that people, well, they're just kicking the can down the road or they're just not dealing with the problem head on. Um, but I think that you could resist that by saying that, well, you know, uh, and, and excuse me for going back to Kennan, but it was, you know, it was some 40-some years after he wrote that, uh, that finally the Soviet Union ceased to exist. Um, uh, and he lived to be a very old man, so he was able, to, he saw that happen. Um, uh, uh, 
So I, I, I guess I'm not sure exactly what to do um, with the organization, except that um, trying to contain uh, its effects are probably the, the best ways. And, and we talked about that in, in law enforcement and hardening targets and making it more difficult to, to hurt people uh, is basically what I'm thinking about, practical sense. So I love your question, so I mean, it's, it's something that I'm fascinated about is, is it the difference between discriminant violence and, and indiscriminate violence? And they use discriminant violence against their peers. I mean, other Sunnis, to be honest. And they use indiscriminate violence against the other. And it helps reinforce the social identity aspects of this. And, the, and then most of you are familiar with that, so I won't go into that. I find that uh, to be fascinating. Also found that um, they were very, so selective to the point where they would get permission. Again, they have very decentralized organization. It's a decentralized, it has a central hub, but it's very decentrally executed. And yet they got permission before they eliminated each and every one of those people that I, that I talked about, which I thought was phenomenal, especially from a communication in an organization that's quote unquote dead. I mean, it's just fascinating that they would get that. And yet I saw it in the engagement reports. I wasn't able to share all of them with you. I just shared a very brief one. But, um, and also within the tribes, there were opportunists who were willing to sell out their cousin in order to get, in order to be promoted within the tribes, tribal leadership structure. So there's all these weird dynamics going on, but they, they've learned to utilize and, and, and leverage those at that level, um, which again shows before they kind of had, they would just leave the tribal shake dead out in the road. And you read about this in 2005 and six, and that was part of the backlash against them, but they've learned not to do that. They still kill tribal shakes, but they get permission from higher and they get kind of permission from the tribe. Well, we'll step up and lead the tribe. So those kind of control dynamics are important, but you're absolutely right. I don't know, and I'm not sure anybody knows how much support they actually have within their own communities. And you know, I'm guessing it's it's stronger than we've ever thought than we think it is, but it's not it's not complete. So if you are able to roll back, as Scott says, some of the apparatus of control, then then you would see naturally at least a Sunni. Leadership. The question is whether there'll be an effective network to lead because we saw, we, we kind of passed off the leadership of the Sunni community in Iraq to the Sunni Sawa, which was not a great idea because they were very disparate. And it, you know, they're still that way now, to, to be honest. They're still alive. I mean, there was a lot of them that were killed, but they're, I mean, they're Sunni tribal sheikhs and they regenerate, I'm sure. Um, so as has the Islamic State. Um, so yeah, okay. did that answer? Thank you. Um, I'm Patrick Hickey with uh, GAO, and I'm currently doing a review of the execution of U.S.'s uh, counter-ISIL strategy. Uh, question for Dr. England about your, your comparisons of these groups and about argue whether or not they might have a future if they meet with some serious drawback. And I would say I want to get your view on there's a, there's a unique uh, aspect of how Daesh operates that's both a weakness and a strength, depending on how you look at it. And that's the presence of the foreign fighters. It gives them prestige. It gives them a unique, uh, uh, gives them a, a, a unique force mu multiplier, if you will. But it also represents a weakness. I mean, they, in order to keep a foreign fighter force engaged, they need a caliphate to defend, a tangible caliphate to defend. So if you argue that uh, ISIL could survive in some form after it maybe inevitably loses Mosul and Raqqa, um, what kind of future uh, would these foreign fighters have? Will they be like a, to throw out a few more metaphors, will they operate like a common turn, you know, go back into the West and be cells for some sort of uh, persistent revolutionary movement, underground movement, or <laughs> be like the Knights Templar, you know, once you lose Jerusalem, you really don't have much of a future. And the Knights Templar, um, which is it? I, uh, I can't answer that question really well, except that what, um, what, what we've seen is that uh, I, th I think what we have is, is two different motivations for the two different groups. And I think that's an easy c conclusion to draw is that Iraqis participate uh, because there are local grievances and that there, there's a local situation that, gives, that, that allows them or, or motivates them to join that operation or to support it. And then you have this, this global vision uh, that is really broad that that encourages people to come in and, 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 and take part in it. Right, so if if the, the, the political situation goes away in Iraq and Syria where that they can no longer, for better or worse, um, uh, participate, 
then maybe those those folks well, won't participate as as much in violence, right? Either because they're 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 being you know so severely repressed that they can't act, or that hopefully maybe they, they'll be allowed to participate. But then if this if this global vision continues, then you'll you'll continue to inspire people to join it, and they may join at home, like we've seen in in Europe when, and we've seen in, in Turkey as well. So, so Max Boot yesterday tweeted, he said, someone said, what is ISIS? He said, well, it's a terror group that later became insurgents and then is now a state with an army. I'm like, well, that sounds like a revolutionary movement that waxes and wanes based off of the support of the population, but also their control of territory. So, in, you know, short answer to your question, it will just retrograde back to the different Maoist phases that, you know, just go back to the organization phase. And, the, and, and, and I gave you an example of that, how you regenerate and, and so until that ideology is defeated, it will, I totally agree with Scott on this one. Uh, Marie Greensmith, uh, University of Massachusetts. Um, I have three comments, and I'd just be interested to see what the panel think about them, and they're on the back of things that you've actually said. First of all, you made a comment about imprisonment being a radicalizer. And um, I suppose that seems to me a bit like saying going to bed is a generator of pregnancy. You know, um, you know it ain't necessarily so. Um, you can go to bed and do other things. Um, equally, it can happen elsewhere. Um, so, I mean, looking at the experience we've had in Northern Ireland, for example, in the 70s we had internment without trial, which was a radicalizer, absolutely. It was the university that gave rise to the modern IRA. In the 1980s we had incarceration, which had some kind of bastardized legal process. And those jails gave birth to, on the loyalist side, a bunch of guys who pumped iron in jail and came out to be drug dealers. And on the Republican side, they did their PhDs and they came out to form what is now the most successful political party on the island of Ireland, which is Sinn Féin. So we can look at other examples. We can look at what Saudi does, for example, with, with jihadis. Um, so there are, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost as if we in the West think about, well, we can't imprison them because it's going to radicalize them without actually thinking how much agency we have about what actually goes on in prisons. So if there is no tr faith and trust in legal process, if people believe that they're imprisoned without any due process, with, with no justification, then it will radicalize. If there is some kind of process and there are educational opportunities made available to people whilst they're in prison, then something rather different can happen. So that's the first point. The second point, I want to talk about politicians. I don't want to get the bobbleheads out again, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, when we first set, our, uh, set up uh, critical terrorism studies, we engaged with the Joint Terrorism Action Committee in the Westminster government, which are the, you know, the MI5s and all that carry on, and they used to come to our events. And they used to be very friendly to us and talk to us and say, we agree with almost everything you say. This is way back in 2005. But, they said, try telling my minister that. Mm -hmm. So my question to you as experts, as practitioners, is this. How the hell do we get past the idea that, in fact, and you said it, you said, it, well, I, I just crunch the data, I'm just the policy analyst, you make the decisions. The you you're talking about are politicians who, God help us, um, looking at some of the candidates that are facing us here, these people are out of office within a period of time. They have no long-term future in these kind of areas. They're juggling this with 20 other portfolios. And it seems to me that in terms of solving the problem of terrorism, we have a political problem. And the problem is democracy, actually. Um, I don't know how we get past that, but it does seem to me that there's a huge issue here for us as people who spend lifetimes looking at these things. And then finally, as interventionists, um, how do we get past what I would like to call the Arafat problem? Okay. Yasser Arafat in the Palestinian Authority, w if you talk to ordinary Palestinians, they, they resented him, he was corrupt, he put his family into places of positions of power, blah 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 The best friend he had in, t in terms of maintaining his position in Palestine, in my view, was the Israeli government, because they would attack him relentlessly. And the response from the Palestinians was, well, he's a bastard, but he's our bastard. So how do you as interventionists deal with that dynamic, that dance, in relation to this particular problem? Thank you. Thank you. 
Any last comments that you want to pick up on? From the it's, a, it's a good question. The Arafat problem is, is right. I don't know how you answer that question. Um, I think the problem with the professional analysts, especially in intelligence analysts, giving advice to policymakers is that, as you said, you know, I'm trying to squeeze one slide into a slide deck of 17, uh, and I've got to communicate a really complex problem in that one page. And it's, it's got to have a picture or a graph. It's got to have a little box at the bottom that has a conclusion. It's got to have a snappy title. Right? So once you put all those elements in there, you don't have a, a whole heck of a lot of space for text. Um, and even if you write something for the president's daily brief, right? So that changes every day, or it changes at least between administrations for sure, right? So one thing that might get in, in on one day is definitely, it may not get in on the next day because the threshold for, for what goes into that PDB document changes based on what the president is doing that day. So yeah, I, I, at, at times it feels like you're chucking a piece of paper over the wall, maybe it sticks, <laughs> and maybe you get something back. Well, I think we're upon the lunch hour, so if I may, uh, I just want to say that as someone who was appointed to the last five GOP administrations, I guess the, only, the, the good news is we have very high quality analysts out there if the politicians will only listen to them. So with that, please join me in thanking Dr. Anglin and Professor Whiteside. <laughs>